Lifting Up Jesus, Opening His Word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. letter, uh, spirit, prophecy, something allegedly coming from Paul saying the day of the Lord has begun. Now they had learned the opposite from Paul. So Paul from Corinth mm -hmm. uh, writes to the Thessalonian believers. And I think what he's doing in chapter 2 is he's telling them you're not in the day of the Lord. Because if you were in the day of the Lord you would see a sequence of events mm -hmm. like the Antichrist in the temple and uh, the Antichrist's miracles, and the Antichrist being overthrown by Christ himself. And right in the midst of it, he says this in verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Now that's in italics, uh, which means that's been sort of added and uh, to kind of smooth over the translation, but mm -hmm. it's referring back to what was called the day of the Lord in the prior verse. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there coming a f come a falling away and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And it's this interesting phrase here, you're not in the day of the Lord because there hasn't been a falling away. Mm -hmm. And it's the Greek noun apostasia, and your typical uh, interpretation of that these days is this is just talking about a spiritual departure. Mm -hmm. You know, the spiritual departure of the world to follow the Antichrist in the tribulation period. That Greek word apostasia <clears throat> has been anglicized uh, into the, our word apostasy. Mm -hmm. And so it would be easy to kind of think of that in that way. Mm -hmm. That's what the Greek word says and that's what the English word says, end of conversation. End of conversation. And most uh, Bible translations today, we can get into this a little later, but they translate it as uh, some kind of spiritual departure. So a rebellion, a revolt, some use the word apostasy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact of the matter is there, and that's the only view I knew for many, many years, but upon further study there's a whole different view of this. That the noun apostasia could mean not a spiritual departure but an actual physical departure, i.e. the rapture. Now the reason this is so significant is it says the falling away shall come first. It's the, that Greek word uh, proton. And if this indeed is talking about the rapture of the church, Paul is very clear that the rapture of the church occurs first. And uh, that settles the long-standing debate, doesn't it, that we've had for the last s several centuries on when does the rapture happen relative to the seven-year tribulation period. You know, it's, as you well know, there's pre-tribulationalists, our view, mm -hmm. mid-tribulationalists, post-tribulationalists, mm -hmm. then you have pre-wrath rapturists, then you have another view called partial rapture, and it's a lot of confusion as you get into that debate. But if Paul is actually saying there's going to be a physical departure first, in other words, before the man of sin comes and the tribulation and so forth, then it's sort of game, set, match. You know, there's no reason to debate this anymore. So that's why how you define apostasia here becomes a big deal. And many people use this as a proof text for the church going through the tribulation, which you and I don't believe. So we have then a, a major discussion underway here. How, how do you interpret this? Uh, and, and what we're talking uh, about here is this letter from Paul, uh, which acknowledges that there are forgeries circulating, mm -hmm. apparently under Paul's name or some other uh, authority, <clears throat> saying 
that, uh, wait a minute, the day of the Lord has already begun, uh, and the tribulation has already begun, and we're in it. And we then have to begin to behave a certain way, apparently. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, what would be your motivation for, for saying that the day of the Lord has already come, and, the, and that you're in it? Uh, w- would it be to gather followers unto yourself? In other words, you become a kind of a, of a leader mm-hmm. of a group of people, and you say, I'm the one that can t- sort of take you through the tribulation. Mm-hmm. Um, I really don't know what the motivation of the proponents of the false doctrine are, but I know that I know the angelic motivation. It's always to cause confusion, and it's to undermine what the apostles have said. And there's always an agenda by Satan to remove the church of Jesus Christ from apostolic teaching because once we we cut that cord we fall prey to anything. Hmm. So Satan somehow is using these uh, imperfect vessels <laughs> the proponents of this false teaching you know to bring confusion. Okay now here's where it gets interesting and <clears throat> your presentation on this is is fascinating because uh, you offer 10 distinct reasons why a particular uh, term in the Bible is in, to be interpreted a certain way. Uh, Let no man deceive you by any means, verse 3, <clears throat> for that day shall not come except there come uh, a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed the son of uh, perdition. And this, this term falling away, translated from the Greek apostasia, is a fulcrum. Mm-hmm. It's a balancing point around mm-hmm. which everything else sort of stands mm-hmm. or falls. Mm-hmm. And you offer ten reasons why that term falling away should be interpreted not as falling away, mm-hmm. but as physical departure. Mm-hmm. It's talking about the physical departure of the church. Right. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live in England with James Jacob Prash. Uh, Jacob Andy Woods uh, bought up 10 points from 2 Thessalonians why he believes that the apostasy is the rapture. Um, we would like you to respond and refute each point. We have already in one instance responded with a clip on Morial TV to his bad Greek etymology concerning the terms apostasy, apostasia, and the underlying verbal form, apostemi, that does not even appear in the text. We'll mention it briefly again. But now he's concocted these supposed ten arguments, or ten points, to say that the rapture is what is meant by the apostasy, not the great falling away. Now we would again preface this by pointing out that even among pre-trib people, even among pre-trib scholars, mainstream pre-tribulational scholars and theologians, those who subscribe to pre-trib, even among them, this is not simply a minority view, it was a view that was virtually unheard of until relatively recently when it was concocted by the likes of Mr. Wood, Thomas Ice, the late Tim LaHaye, and a few others. Wayne House now promotes it. It was never the view among most pre-tribulational people, let alone others. It is very much something that is newfangled in its popularity, if not in its origin. Let's begin by looking at his 10 points. His first case is that it can't be speaking of an apostasy in the sense of a great falling away, for the simple reason There have always been heresies. There has always been doctrinal apostasy. So therefore, this could not mean some specific apostasy because there has always been apostasy. Without trying to be vitriolic or abusive or taking an ad hominem response to what he's saying, frankly, this is absolutely ludicrous. It is silly to make such a proposition. The Lord Jesus himself in the Olivet Discourse made it clear that the deception of the last days, the apostasy of the last days, the proliferation of false teachers and false prophets in the last days would be unique. 
not simply in magnitude, but in its association with the advent of Antichrist. Not only that, but he himself admits that without grammatical necessity, the definite article appears in the great in the Greek text Ho Apostasia to make it emphatic. Therefore, when you're saying the apostasy, you are singling it out, designating it as something unique. His own argument, the basis, his claim that because there's always been apostasy, it can't be talking about apostasy in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. It must be talking about the rapture. Well, let's see what Paul says concerning this very issue. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes, But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, explicitly says, In the latter times, some will fall away. There's the word in Greek, apostatize. It is a unique end of the world falling away, close of the age falling away. Paul says so, Jesus says so, it is different than the kinds of heresies and even ages of apostasy that have always taken place. It is something singularly unique. This is clear from the apostolic writings, it's clear from the teaching of Jesus, and it's even clear from the Greek text. It uses a definite article that is not required to make it emphatic that it is something unique. This is absolutely preposterous, what he's saying. Again, most mainstream pre-tribulationists, including pre-tribulational scholars, seminary professors, academics, do not agree with him. It's silly. His second point. He tries to claim that Paul only warns about last days or latter days or close of the age apostasy later in his ministry, specifically again, 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is crazy, but let's begin at the beginning. Jesus certainly had already warned of last days, deception, apostasy, false teachers, false prophets, as we pointed out. Not only that, but the first book of the New Testament written was the epistle of James, written to Jewish believers. James clearly warns about the deception of riches in the last days. We would also note that the Antichrist will be a lover of money, according to the book of Daniel, and the character of the other son of perdition, Judas Iscariot. James was written before Paul, before Paul wrote 1st or 2nd Thessalonians, or what may have been his first epistle, Galatians. James had already warned of it. The apostles were already warning of it. Peter would later warn of it. On what basis can he say that 2nd Thessalonians is not warning about an end times apostasy? No basis. He has no exegetical basis whatsoever. In fact, if we read the close of 1 Thessalonians, which had to be written probably less than a year earlier than 2 Thessalonians, we read the following caveat. Let's look at it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says this. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterance. But examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He puts that in the context of the parousia, of the return of Jesus. In other words, in the last days, you would have a danger of cessationism. 
People like John MacArthur saying that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles. Despise not prophetic utterance, quench not the Spirit. Test everything scripturally. Now that is a general truth for all Christians in all cultures at all times. But 1 Thessalonians closes placing those caveats, those warnings, specifically in an end times closing. Look at it again. Hold fast to that which is true. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that means it has specific meaning to believers who will be here when the Lord comes, even though it applies to all believers for all times, the dead in Christ rise first, we meet them in the air, etc. The man doesn't know what he's talking about. He has absolutely no exegetical basis, nothing in text or context or context to say that Paul cannot be talking about an end times falling away doctrinally because that's something Paul only talks about later in his ministry. This is nonsense. It is absolute nonsense. Jesus had already spoke of it, James had already spoke of it, and Paul had already spoke of it before he wrote Second Thessalonians. There is certainly no grammatical or historical grounds for a disconnect between 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. None. He makes this stuff up, apparently. He invents it as he goes along. It's ridiculous. Again, you'd be hard-pressed to find, other than a few crackpots, serious pre-tribulational scholars who would sanction such an erroneous interpretation without any grounds to do so exegetically. That is his second point. His third point we've already pointed out. The definite article of the apostasy. The fact that it's the definite article means he's speaking about something unique for the last days. He makes the point that's the opposite of the point he's trying to make. He appears too ignorant to realize it, but he's arguing against his own contention by pointing out the definite article. His fourth point is one we've already addressed. The verbal form, aphestiomai, underlying apostasia is not found in the text. It's not there. To say because the verbal form of the underlying Greek term can mean a spatial departure. It doesn't have to, but it can mean that. Therefore, this means it means that apostasy, not the verb, is a spatial departure. It's absolute nonsense. It's ridiculous. When we look at Acts 21.21, when we look at various other passages, Hebrews 8.12, Luke 8.13, which he himself acknowledges. There's no way you can determine that a different word, a different word, not even in the text, means that the word that does appear in the text means a spatial departure. This is craziness. This is craziness. Now, to support this, he points out that a number of English translations before the King James, or apart from the King James, use the term departure instead of fall away. 
So what? That does not mandate that it's a departure physically or spatially or geographically. It's a departure from the faith. The same word, not an underlying Greek verbal form, but the same word apostasy used in the context of the last days is again the exact same term used in 1 Timothy chapter 4 by Paul, once again in the context of the last days. We interpret what Paul said about the last days in light of what Paul said about the last days. The Spirit explicitly states that in the latter times, some will apostatize from the faith. That is how Paul uses the word apostasy. The fact that there is a verbal form of the underlying Greek that could mean a spatial departure proves nothing. In fact, Aphnis DMI is used probably four times to mean apostasy and apostasia used by Paul means apostasy. What he says is ridiculous. It is pseudo-scholarship. It is nonsensical. I'm not trying to revile him. Let's continue. Let's look at his next case in point. He states that in his sixth point, the advent of Antichrist will be something sudden concerning the restraining, that the advent of the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, will be something sudden. This is absolutely not true. Now, we cannot base doctrine on type, but Jesus comes to our aid. He makes it very clear that the Shikuts on Neshomem in Aramaic, spoken of by Daniel, will happen again. Jesus making reference to Antiochus Epiphanes, the story of the Maccabees from 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Jesus affirmed the historical and prophetic validity of this prophecy in Daniel and its historical fulfillment in the books of Maccabees in John 10 when he celebrated Hanukkah, translated in most English Bibles as the Feast of Dedication. Antiochus Epiphanes, as we see in Daniel, will have his deeds, his actions, recapitulated by the Antichrist. There's wide agreement, even among pre-trib scholars, as much as anybody. Even Thomas Ice once agreed to this, that Antiochus fulfills the prophecies of Daniel chapter 11 up until verse 36, but not afterwards. The Antichrist will come in the character of Antiochus, recapitulate what Antiochus does, and fulfill the rest of it. Again, priests, trib, scholars believe that. It is certainly progressive. Now, it's illustrated by the type of Judas as the son of perdition. He was active for some time, but only Jesus knew what he was about, what he was doing, and what he was going to do. It was not sudden. His revelation to the apostles was sudden, but his actions were not. Antiochus was progressive. What he did was progressive until he ultimately set up the image of Zeus, giving the Greek god Zeus his own features in the temple. This is what the Antichrist will in some way do. He doesn't understand what he's talking about. It is not what he says. It is not just here he is. It is progressive. Just like Antiochus and as with Judas. Let's go on. Let's look at this. Somehow he points out that every chapter in Thessalonians 
concludes with the return of Christ. What is he talking about? There are no chapters in the original Greek canon. They don't exist in the epistle as Paul was inspired to write it. They were interpolated later by the church. They're not even there. The fact that they occur now at the end of chapter demarcations is irrelevant because there were no chapter demarcations when it was first written. He goes on to say that the immediate context favors a spatial departure as opposed to a deception. No, it doesn't. The context speaks of the Lord sending a delusion to make them believe what is false. As in Zechariah 11, the advent of Antichrist will in part be a judgment, just as it was with King Ahab's false prophets in the days of Micaiah. The Lord put a lying spirit in their mouth. People reject the true Messiah and embrace a false one. God gives them over to it. What he says is completely erroneous. No, the immediate context, the context supports. It is a deception that God allows. Yes, a work of Satan, but God allows it in judgment to those who reject the truth, to those who do not love a knowledge of the truth. The Lord gives them over to believe the deception. Israel and the Jews, at least the unbelievers among them, and most of them will be unbelievers, will make a covenant with death. You reject your true Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, they're going to have a false one. If Jesus didn't come back, none of them would be saved. The immediate context supports apostasy and departing from the truth. Then he goes on saying the Holy Spirit is the restrainer and will be taken so the Antichrist can be manifested. Although I am sure that our pre wrath brethren have the timing and sequence of the rapture and resurrection correct, before Marvin Rosenthal wrote his book, before the term pre-wrath was coined, I and others, I was not the only one, and I was certainly not the first one, I always believed the rapture and resurrection were between the sixth and seventh seals. I've always believed that, long before pre-wrath or any of this. I always believed that the rapture could not happen until the faithful church knew who the Antichrist was and could prove it based on the number of the beast and his taking his place in the temple. I always believed that. I always said there was a distinction between tribulation, which comes from the devil, and wrath, that comes from God. Different words in Greek and Hebrew. Haron, ya, metzorot. In Greek, different words again. Orge, and Thelipsis, third word being Paresmos. There are different words that mean different things. I always said this. But while I share much common ground with our uh, wrath brethren, and they're mostly right about most of what they say, I disagree with them about the restrainer being Archangel Michael. I also believe the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. But that does not mean that the Holy Spirit is taken, therefore the church is raptured. That's not what it says in Greek. I will read the verse in English, then I will read it in Greek and go through the grammar word by word. First Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading that verse he points out. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Some have suggested this is the rapture. 
here Mr. Wood seems to be saying the same thing. The Holy Spirit being taken must be there. This is what it says in Greek. And the Gertai, Heis enomius mono, ho katakon, arti hios, ek mizu genetai. Energetic, get the word energized for energy, is indicative mood, present tense, middle voice, third person singular. It means is acting or is in operation at the present time. Taste is simply a genitive singular feminine, meaning of or of the anomious monarch. That is the only one of lawlessness, the enomo, the man of lawlessness, the antichrist. This is genitive singular feminine, okay? an adverb that becomes a nominative singular masculine. An obvious monon ho The verb participle, present active nominative singular masculine. The one holding down or detaining, detaining or like holding down, making immobile, kind of. Okay. And it's already happening. It's a participle. Nominative singular masculine. Okay. Arte heos. That's just an adverb conjunctive. Meaning it's doing it now. It's at the present time. Until something else. Ek, going out of, that's just a preposition. Mizo, from the midst of, as it were. That's a genitive case, and it is neuter, of the midst. Mizo, genitai. Subjunctive mood, however, it is a middle voice deponent, third person singular. The fact that it's subjunctive on its own would mean it implies the possibility of it not happening or an element of doubt that it will happen. However, there's deponency. It's a middle voice deponent. Now, a middle voice in Greek is, is a reflexive. It means the person doing the action is the recipient of the action. Okay? So what you have then is, although it's subjunctive mood, it is active in its translation or meaning. There's no future middle voice for this. There doesn't need to be one. In other words, although it's subjunctive, once this thing stops being held down, it's going to happen because it's a deponent. Now, I'm not a Greek expert, but my Greek is pretty good. I am told by people whose Greek is very good. Submit my Greek exegesis to any professor of Greek, he's not going to tell you I'm wrong in what I'm saying. There is nothing in the text grammatically, nothing in the vocabulary, nothing that says the Holy Spirit is going to be taken. All it really says is the one who restrains is going to stop restraining. Even John MacArthur admitted that in one of his teachings. The only thing it says is the one restraining is going to stop restraining. It doesn't mean he's going to leave or be taken. That word he likes so much, the verbal form of the underlying term for Apostasia, apostemi, is not in the verse. It's not even there. It simply says the one who's restraining will stop doing it at some points. Anything else is asegesis. You're reading into the text something not there. That is his seventh point. His eighth point. This is his argument. That 
noted scholars, and he lists a number of them that he says are noted scholars, say that it's a spatial departure. But then he admits their view is the minority view. I knew Tim LaHaye. I did conferences with him various times. He was a nice man, but frankly, he was no scholar. Yes, other people who believe it would include Thomas Ice and Wayne House, possibly, but the majority of pre-trib scholars don't believe it. The real pre-trib scholars with the real doctorates, not the ones with the make-believe doctorates, like Thomas Ice. The real doctorates. Mark Hitchcock, a lawyer who's also a theologian, who did a splendid job in his debate with Hank Hanegraaff, says that the word would be hard paid so here if it meant the spatial departure. Most pre-trib scholars dismiss what Mr. Woods is saying. They don't believe it. He cannot give you an impressive repertoire of academic theologians who believe it's a spatial departure because most academic theologians don't, including the pre-trib ones. He goes on again to his early translations, pointing out that Jerome in the Vulgate uses the word decisio. So what? That means nothing. It just says departure. It doesn't say it's spatial. And the context supports that it isn't. So he gives us these 10 points. Finally, he says in his 10th point that Paul is just giving a review of things he said earlier. That's the reason he didn't use the word hard pencil. What do you mean Paul was just giving a review and that's why he didn't use the word hard pencil? If you're reviewing something in Greek, it's what you do in English. You refer specifically to that which you were reviewing. His argument is not even cogent. Ten abject points. Ten points of pure pseudo-scholarly folly. Ten points of make-believe exegesis. Ten points that most serious pre-trib scholars do not agree with never have and still don't. There's always been heresy. Yes, but there's a definite article here, and it refers exactly to what's in 1 Timothy 4.1. It's a specific apostasy, the one that Jesus talked about in the Olivet Discourse. That Paul only talked about apostasy in his later writings that's nonsense. He has no basis to say that this is not about an end-time apostasy other than he says so. First Thessalonians closes with it. James precedes First and Second Thessalonians in the date of its authorship and deals with it. Again, the definite article. It's there to be emphatic. It's talking about something specific. That was his third point. But at the CMI, as an underlying verbal form of apostasy, can mean a spatial departure. Yeah, but in Hebrews and in Luke and in Acts, it doesn't. No place in any eschatological context does it. This becomes ludicrous. 
He seems to lose count in his presentation that all the chapters in Thessalonians close with reference to the return of Christ. There were no chapters in the original canon. Six, that is progressive. No, it's not progressive. Jesus made it clear it would be like the Shikuts Hamneshomem, spoken of by Daniel. Antiochus behaved progressively, as did Judas, the other son of perdition. He had no basis to say that it's not progressive, that it's spontaneous or sudden. None! Seven, immediate context favors spatial departure. No, it doesn't. Immediate context favors falling away from the truth. The Lord will send a deluding influence upon them to make them believe what is false because they don't love the truth. Eight. It's only a review of something he said earlier. That's why he doesn't use the term harpezo. This is nonsense. The pre-trib scholar a real scholar, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, among others, states the word would be hard paid so. The nonsense of arguing that the only reason he doesn't refer to hard paid so in his review as hard paid so is because it's a review. That's silly. It's not even logically coherent. Nine early translations say it's a departure. So what? It doesn't mean it's a spatial departure. A departure from the truth. The tenth, many scholars, many scholars say it is. And then he admits most scholars, including most pre trip scholars, say it isn't. How can that possibly be an argument in favor of his thesis when he admits most scholars, including most pre-trib ones, don't agree? The Bible college or seminary where he teaches is not accredited. It's easy to see why. In an accredited Bible college or seminary, where people are required to know Greek and Hebrew, they would laugh this stuff off. They'd laugh it off. Pre-trib people, pre-trib institutions, they would laugh this off. Now I'm trying not to revile, trying not to mock, trying not to ridicule. But it's difficult not to. This is completely and utterly absurd. Not only wrong, it's absurd. I'm told that Mr. Wood, by profession, is not a theologian, but a lawyer, even though he did go to, I think, Dallas Seminary or some seminary. He seems like a lawyer with a weak case, trying to convince a jury of laymen about something that expert testimony would easily refute. Is using hollow argumentation, abject presentations that do not have a logical anchorage, things that are exegetically unsupportable, that are linguistically nonsensical. Yet this is his case. Mr. Wood. If you want to debate me from the Greek text before independent witnesses, before graduates of your alumnus, I'll be there. Sir, this is pseudo-academic. It is not scholarly argumentation. It is completely abject. Ten points. Ten points of folly. My name is James Jacob Prash. 
Morio Ministries, thank you so much for listening. God bless. Thank you.